Hi guys, and welcome back to Capitalism, where everything's a commodity, even murder. True crime is very hot right now. There are literally hundreds of true crime podcasts just on Apple Podcasts alone. And when you add to that the thousands of YouTube channels and all the other platforms telling their audiences grisly tales of murders and disappearances, you've got quite the buffet of nefarious nuggets right there at your fingertips. The true crime podcast genre has become so popular that there are even TV shows on major streaming services about making true crime podcasts. The most notable of these is probably Only Murders in the Building on Disney+, Plus, which racked up an impressive 719 million streaming minutes the week its third season launched in August of 2023. There's nothing new about true crime being a source of entertainment. One of my favorite shows growing up was Unsolved Mysteries, and while the argument could be made that that show focused more on solving crimes than being entertainment, the disclaimer that they played at the beginning of every episode kind of showed you what they were really all about. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. They wanted to make it very clear that they are entertainment, and so some dramatic license was taken when it came to things like their famous reenactments, as well as their segments about completely made-up nonsense like ghosts and psychics. And even before TV, newspapers were making money and attracting readers by hyping up killers, like here in the Daily Telegraph of London where a letter from Jack the Ripper was published, along with vivid details from a person who saw the aftermath of one of his slayings in Whitechapel. So yeah, people have always been interested in this sort of thing, and right now, the macabre makes money. In just one example as reported in Marketplace, the New York Times bought The Serial Podcast for an astounding $25 million back in 2020. It's hard to dig up numbers on the true crime industrial complex as a whole, but if you consider the number of podcasts, documentaries, TV series, and of course, CrimeCon, there's easily hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on the table. Yeah, I have to talk about CrimeCon here for a second. I first heard about this when I was watching an episode of Based on a True Story, which is another TV show about making a true crime podcast, and I thought that the idea of a true crime convention was just satire, like this show has a lot of dark humor in it like that. But no, CrimeCon is a real thing, a real expensive thing. Tickets for CrimeCon 24 in Nashville start at $379 and go all the way up to $16.99. Organizers say the event is equal parts education and experience and is a wide-ranging program that has something for everyone. There is unquestionably an audience for true crime stories, and I don't think you can blame content creators for trying to profit off that demand. As I delved into this topic while I was putting together ideas for this video, I got to wondering, with all this money flying around and the millions of hours of content available, is it healthy for people to consume so much true crime? And moreover, is it ethical to produce true crime content? Hey, hi, it's me here from the Hypocrisy Cam. I just want to take this opportunity to point out that I fully acknowledge and am aware that I am right now at this moment making a piece of monetized true crime content that is questioning the ethics of making pieces of monetized true crime content. And I even put Chris Watts' stupid fucking face in my thumbnail to get those sweet, sweet clicks. But... As I settle into my cozy three bedroom, two and a half bath glass house, I just want to point out that I'm not calling out any creators or consumers for listening to or making true crime. I just want to talk about an aspect of the true crime phenomenon that I find to be particularly interesting. Lindsay A. Sherrill, assistant professor of business communications at the University of North Alabama, gave a fascinating TED talk posted back in October of 2022, urging true crime audiences to become more mindful consumers of the genre and focus on creators she says are doing the good work and not those producing what she calls murder porn. Yeah, hi, uh, we aren't getting our informative murder porn. She says true crime can be consumed ethically if it results in some kind of good. That can include, she says, the community aspect of true crime and how it can help victims find strength and empowerment by hearing the stories of others, consumers wanting to learn something new, considering the point of view of the victims, and whether any good can come from retelling a crime story. Unethical consumption, she says, includes interest derived solely from the excitement or gory details of a crime, veneration of a criminal or victim, or otherwise a purely hedonistic drive to be entertained without any further introspection. Cheryl's talk focuses on the true crime audience, and that's definitely an important aspect to look at when you're examining the ethics of true crime. But that is for the individual audience member to decide. I'm not going to sit here and lecture anyone on their motivations for doing anything. But I can talk a little bit about the production side as both a current content creator and a former journalist with a lot of experience writing stories about crime, criminals, and victims. If we agree with Cheryl's outline for the ethical consumption of true crime, I think it holds that ethical production of true crime is also possible if it's done with the intent to elicit ethical consumption. That is to say, as long as you're not making murder porn, you're probably good. 
In my career as a newspaper journalist, I had to write about lots of tragic and unimaginable things. I would edit news stories about atrocities, war, court cases with disturbing evidence, and most tragically, stories where children were hurt or killed. On many occasions, my colleagues and I would make the decision to remove unnecessarily gory details from some copy because we felt they were just too disturbing or upsetting to be passed on, and those details weren't particularly germane to the overall story. But the editorial process also included thinking about what would get attention, reaction, and comment from our readers. What would get them to buy our newspaper, to read our stories? In short, what would be entertaining? There's a colossal ethical question about the division between entertainment and information. And any journalist who tells you that they don't purposefully package their work to be a little bit of both is lying to you. But as long as you're making content that is informative, that advocates, or that otherwise meets Professor Sherrill's criteria for ethical consumption of true crime, I think it's okay to produce true crime content. But intentions aside, there is an element of sensitivity that has to be involved if you're going to talk about true crime. So here's a clip from a podcast that I heard, and if you clicked on this video, you've probably heard of it too. Uh, in it, the hosts are talking about Shanann Watts, a 34-year-old mother who, along with her two children aged four and two, was murdered by her husband, Chris Watts, back in 2018. <laughs> Chris Watts' wife's name is, sh sh I can't say it. Now, to be completely fair, the hosts were talking about a documentary about the Watts family murder, so there is one degree of narrative separation there. But in my opinion, when you're talking about a murdered woman and her two murdered children, there is no room for this kind of levity. So when does the production of true crime become unethical? I think right around here. Now that we've decided it's okay to produce and consume true crime under certain circumstances, I think we have to ask, is it harmful to consume so much true crime? Well, I think that's a lot like asking whether it's okay to drink alcohol. You know, one or two drinks a week is probably not gonna hurt you. Your body can handle that. But two or three bottles of whiskey two or three times a week, and you're gonna have massive physiological problems. Like everything else, moderation is the key. The Cleveland Clinic's Dr. Chivana Childs says that overconsumption of true crime can cause some damaging psychological issues. If you're hypervigilant, your anxiety has increased, you're fearful of leaving home, and you're thinking more about true crime than anything else, it's time to take a break, she said in a press release posted to the clinic's website. Professor Elizabeth Yardley, a criminologist at Birmingham City University, wrote in 2018 that, based on her study of several serialized podcasts, they do little to spur any social change and leave consumers in a state of vertigo with little, if any, feelings of resolution or satisfaction, priming them to seek out and consume more true crime content. True crime podcasts, Yardley writes, pay lip service to the idea of action and change by revealing inequalities and injustices to their listeners. They offer glimpses of traumatic social realities. They expose us to the misery of others and encourage us to feel their pain. However, serialized podcasts end unfinished and incomplete, leaving listeners in a state of vertigo. The void is soon filled with another podcast, a new trauma to become temporarily obsessed with. Yardley continues, it doesn't matter whose trauma it is, the people whose stories we consume become interchangeable and blur into a homogenous mass. As one podcast ends without a satisfactory conclusion, we find another one to fill the void. Our desire for more signifies the lack and absence that characterizes consumer capitalism. We are never really satisfied, but as long as we have a ready supply of trauma to consume, we will never linger on one case long enough to call for any action about the broader harms that serialized true crime podcasts allow us to glimpse. While the vast majority of true crime fans may fit Yardley's description of the never satisfied consumer, there is a subset of true crime enthusiasts who become particularly fixated on a single case and delve headfirst into obsession. Now, in compiling research for this video, as well as my own true crime consumption habits, I happen to notice that one of the most discussed and dissected cases is that of the Watts family murders, which I alluded to earlier. The Watts family case is one that people tend to really latch on to, and I think that there are a couple reasons for that. The story was international news when it happened in 2018, and thanks to the Netflix documentary American Murder released in 2020, the Watts family murders became a staple of the true crime community. There are thousands of YouTube videos and podcasts about every conceivable element of the Watts case, even completely bonkers stuff that was never even part of the case to begin with. The first reason for its popularity is obviously the Netflix documentary, which artfully stitched together police body cam footage, interrogation video, personal text messages and voicemails, and clips of Shanann's Facebook posts to tell the story of the days and weeks leading up to the murders. 
from a journalistic point of view, you couldn't really ask for better source material, and I think that's what made the case so captivating. Everything is on video and in writing. There's no ambiguity and little room for interpretation. Viewers felt like they were there when the police were searching the Watts family home, or that they were a part of the interrogation, or even that they knew what Shanann was thinking and feeling about Chris and their marriage in the days and weeks leading up to her murder. Add to this the fact that Shanann's Facebook page is still publicly accessible at the time I was writing and producing this video, with most of the clips used in the documentary still on there. The page is full of videos of the murdered children doing kid stuff, and even of Shanann and Chris playing the role of the happily married couple. By going through her posts, watching the videos, and studying the image she was cultivating for herself, people really thought they knew the real Shanann Watts. The thing about that is, though, is that they don't. They don't know her. People have formed a really unhealthy parasocial relationship with Shanann Watts to the point that, astonishingly, there exists Watts family fan fiction. Now, in my career as a journalist, I had to read about and write about all kinds of stories that just stuck with me, that you can't stop thinking about for a few days. They Stories that make you feel gross, that make you feel hopeless, or that make you feel, you know, indignation. But nothing that I ever wrote or read in my entire career came close to giving me the same feelings that I got when I read this Watts Family fan fiction. It's an expression of self-importance. It's an expression of like a narrow worldview and expression of delusion, and it's just plain weird. Look, I understand that creating art can be a critical tool to work through and express emotion in times of strife and turmoil, and I'm not here to shit all over anyone's artistic expression. So much good art comes from suffering and from wanting to make sense of the world and trying to understand what's going on within oneself and outside of oneself. I want to be able to tell myself that this is just art. It's just an expression of grief by someone who feels empathy towards murder victims. But... I've been a writer and an editor for close to 25 years, and that's really not what I read into the vast majority of these works. They come across as weird, creepy, obsessive, and completely unhinged. Now, I'll add here that I don't know any of the authors of these pieces of Watts fanfiction, so for all I know, they could be close friends and family of Shanann, and this is their way of grieving. That doesn't make it any less bizarre, in my opinion, but it does make it a little more understandable. But in the more likely case that these are just authors who are in an unhealthy state of mind about this case in particular, the question remains, is consumption of true crime healthy? Well, obviously, not for everyone. And speaking of unhealthy parasocial relationships, people were starting to form them with Chris Watts, too, starting shortly after his arrest. The 2,000-page discovery document that's been available online since the case was closed features almost 100 pages of letters Watts received while he was being held in Weld County Jail. Many are people saying that they are praying for him and his family, others taunt him and wish him death, and perhaps most disturbingly, there are so many thirst letters from women all over the U.S. saying they saw Watts on TV and want to be his friend. Some women even included photos of themselves, although I have the sense that some of these might just be attempts at catfishing. But the one that I think encapsulates the emotional maturity of the kind of person who would be attracted to a family annihilator, and as an extension, the kind of person who is an unhealthy consumer of true crime, is this one from Ashley. You really have to wonder, when you see something like this, the kind of damage consuming true crime might do to a person who is already this emotionally stunted or unaware. I've given this subject a lot of thought, as I've recently had a lot more time to listen to true crime podcasts as I walk my new puppy around the neighborhood. I thought a lot about whether I was being entertained by the suffering of others, and when I put it like that, it sounds like a pretty terrible way to pass the time. I found myself coming home from walks feeling not so good. I put the brakes on listening to true crime for a while and wondered about its effects on people. I started looking into it, and what I came across was interesting to me, so I decided to make a video about it. I'm not an expert, and I'm sure there are a lot of counterpoints to the academic sources that I've listed here. But as with everything else, it's really up to you. If true crime motivates you or inspires you in some way, then I don't think there's anything wrong with popping on a podcast while you're on the treadmill or commuting to work. Just pay attention to how you're feeling, look after yourself, and don't fall down any rabbit holes. Thank you so much for watching. There's some more of my content on screen now. I'm so close to 1,000 subs, and I'm really trying to make that happen, so don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.